I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life living in Nicaragua. Today, we've got viewer questions, and we're going to be answering those for you here on the show. We've got two different ones. Both are pretty small, but we want to get to these things. We want you guys to be able to participate. So if you have questions, get down there in the show notes and either ask your questions by text. Always put it directly to me. Don't do it farther down in a thread because those don't always show up to me, and I don't know that you're asking those questions. So put them directly at the top so I know that they're there. Or even better, check the show notes. You can send in a video question, and you you could be on the show as well with me, and I can answer the question that way. Of course, you'll be on the show virtually from a distance where you are. You won't fly you in to Nicaragua for it in most circumstances. But, you know, it seems like you're here because we put you on the show. Anyway, we're going to get to that right after the phone. Okay, everybody, let's get right to this. This is... A Dodd uh, Ultrick writes in, thank you for all your valuable and honest, unbiased info. You have already answered tons of questions for us. Wife and I are flying down from Alberta, Canada for two months in January. We hope to figure out a lot in those two months. We are winding down our small weed control business. I assume that that is a thing that kills weeds in your yard, not people who track down people with weed businesses. Anyway, we've chosen October 1st, 2025 to drive down with a 16 foot cargo trailer, 30 years old, full of my small machine shop to continue designing my stainless steel art sculptures. I have a special welder that may be difficult to replace and many specialized tools for stainless steel. Our second reason for driving is to bring our two dogs and household items is questions. One, can I import my tools and equipment and household as a visitor? Two, can the 30 year old camper trailer be imported or only visit? Three, I understand my preserved low mileage 2014 Tacoma will only be visiting and return to Canada as it is over 10 years old. Can my truck visit 90 days before becoming a pain in the butt? Thanks for your time. Okay, so, woo, this is going to be tough. Let's, as always, start from the bottom up for whatever reason. And number three, you're probably okay with the 90 days with the old truck. Old truck is not that old. I don't actually know how much the 10-year thing is going to be a problem for importation, but really, really, really important for, for all these questions is you only get the right to import if you become an official resident. Now, some people have reported that they can do this pretty quickly. Jerry on the on the community has done this and he moved through the process quickly and it was not, not a big deal for him, but he's, I believe, looking at retirement residencia, which obviously moves much faster. You, you basically just have to prove that you're here, uh, that you do have the income that you need, that you're over a certain age and those kinds of things. It's really quite simple because the requirements are quite low, but the things you get for it are quite low as well. It's just one year at a time and you just have to constantly renew. And I'm just noticing my bird bath is like totally falling over. The bird bath is built, I'll try to get video of it, is built in dirt, not completely out of concrete and it's full of ants and they've taken away the support so the middle of it is just collapsing i'm pretty sure we can find a way to put it back but it's so heavy that i don't know how we'll actually do that so that's a problem anyway so so all these things importation requires residencia so normally under normal circumstances i totally understand the dogs create this this need for things to happen in in a potent, in a different order than you may anticipate otherwise under normal circumstances the things that we would say to do is that you need to come down spend some time maybe not a lot you know do your initial investigation which they are not a problem they're coming down and doing an initial investigation make sure that this is the place you want to come make sure that you are going to be comfortable with the weather, the language, the food, whatever, right? All that kind of stuff. Perfect. We had a video just recently about a family came down and failed to stay because they tested nothing and weren't realistic in any way and didn't approach it seriously in any way. And I have one coming out in maybe a month. It's already been recorded. It's already been uploaded, uh, but I don't know when it's scheduled. I'm talking about another failure that happened. Similarly, did no research in person. Did a lot of research not in person, but it's not as meaningful as you might think. So, so Dodd and, and his wife, uh, they're doing a great thing. They're coming down for a good amount of time. They're going to do that, and then they're planning on moving down with all this stuff. Great. But they do have the option during those two months to immediately begin the residencia process, assuming that their retirement age, which is 45 here, so I think we're safe. So as long as they're a bit younger than me or older, then they're going to have no problem with retirement residencia. And if they in the future want some other residencia, right, they decide in the future they don't invest in a business and do all kinds of stuff, then they could pursue business residencia. But until then, they could do retirement residencia. The reason that this is important is that when you are 
a resident. At the time that you become a resident, you get the right to import a vehicle. Maybe not that old one. That's something they'd have to look into. We'd have to find out for sure. I hear a lot of people mention the 10-year thing, but a 2014 is still technically 10 years here, so it may may be okay, but by the time they go to do it, it may not. It may be that they look the other way that's close enough. It may be in great condition. They don't care. I don't know. I don't, I've don't. i never had someone try to import an older vehicle, so I, I can't answer how that's going to work. But it might be possible, but generally you don't want to do it anyway, so it never comes up. Uh, the effort to import and do anything like that is, is generally pretty high, and owning a vehicle that was not built for this market is not generally desirable, so that is normally um, going to be okay. Uh, as far as, as decision-making goes. In the situation where you have the um, 90 days, you're probably okay. It's going to be a bit of a pain because vehicles can only be uh, brought in for 30 days at a time. So that's going to be renewals for that vehicle when you're not doing renewals for, for you guys as people. Uh, so that's super annoying. Um, but it's not the end of the world. And as long as it's only the vehicle, that's it. Okay, so let's move up to Part number two, the trailer. The fact that the trailer is old, I don't anticipate it's going to cause any problems. Trailers are not track-like vehicles. They don't have engines. It, it doesn't wear out the same. It's a different animal. However, when you enter the country with a trailer, that trailer is not a separate item. Your truck and the trailer are one. This is very important because that means that you may never use that vehicle without the trailer. That doesn't mean you can't drop the trailer in you know, your your rented yard and drive around the country without it, that's okay. But you can't do your renewals without it. So that trailer means you have to be doing a 30-day renewal of the truck with a trailer, and you must drive to Managua to do that. So what was a bit annoying but not terrible with the truck alone has now become a really big deal because constantly driving in uh, uh, Managua with a trailer isn't super fun. Now, I know people who came down with a unique vehicle, a Jeep Wrangler, and a trailer, and it was absolute abject disaster. I would only do this. I would only consider bringing a trailer if you are completely certain that you will be exiting with all of the equipment within 30 days. I would not want to face a renewal because of their situation, because the trailer created so many problems. They were going to Managua, not every 30 days, but every 15 days. And because they constantly couldn't get in to see the people that they needed, it turned into more like every three to four days because they constantly had to go because there was so much paperwork because bringing a trailer is they they will do anything to make sure you would never actually consider this. If you knew what it was like bringing a trailer, you would not ask me this question. Can you legally do it? Yes. Can you leave it here? Absolutely not. So that's important to understand that, that bringing the trailer will create a complete and utter problem of huge degrees. The sun moved on me. Okay, so, so by having the trailer here, uh, that means that you have to turn around and get out of the country really quickly. It means your vehicle is not eligible for import because you brought a trailer. That because they have to be hooked together and they have to be renewed and all that all the time. Now, because you don't have residencia, you can't import that vehicle anyway. So that is a future thing that you'll have to do when you you get residencia, then you can bring in the vehicle that way if you get it all worked out and you're able to bring in one that old. The trailer will always have to be hooked to it. So until you're able to import a vehicle that is eligible for import, you can't import that trailer. So that is really important to be understanding just how much problem that creates, that it's the combination of the two that turns it from a huge pain into, I don't know how you could possibly deal with that. Right. And anything that's old isn't going to make sense. The amount of money that you're likely to have to pay, because while you get an import of a vehicle, I don't believe you get the import of a trailer. So you'd be paying potentially many thousands of dollars. It would be very easy for the importation costs uh, of the trailer to be greater than the value of the trailer. That would be easy. It may not end up that way, but it easily could be. And the problem is once you bring it down, you're trapped. You don't have an easy way to take it out of the country again. I mean, you can, but you have to drive back through Honduras, back through Guatemala, back through Mexico, back into the U.S. 
and then into Canada. Like the distances that you're talking about having to go to have a legal means of dealing with your vehicle are so extreme. Like we say that Americans shouldn't do this and they only have to make it from the Texas border or from the Arizona, California borders down here. They are so much closer. But for a Canadian, you have all of the United States in between our normal never do this and where you're going to be that you have to get the vehicle to return it to home. Like this is I totally understand with the dogs. I would say drive down with the dog separately, everything else, put in a shipping container and do it that way. Which brings us to your equipment. Can you import this? Well, basically you can import anything. So when you're simply saying import, do you have the right to do importation into Nicaragua? Yes, you absolutely can import basically anything that isn't the controlled substance, right? So you can import drones, you can't import drugs. That's kind of it, right? Anything else, you just pay whatever the importation tax is. You, all those things that you can't buy here, it's just because someone isn't paying the importation tax. They don't have enough resale value or enough interested or, or the market isn't aware of the products. Uh, but if you had some specialty networking gear that no one else had, special cell phones or computers or video games or just any of those things that people kind of feel like aren't available here, could you import them? Absolutely. They're not controlling that stuff. It's just that there's no market for it or it's really costly. So don't be surprised, though, if you don't go through proper channels. If you try to bring things in on a trailer, this is where you got to be really clear for people who are thinking about importing. Right? You think about this in the U.S. and Canadian context. What you're talking about when you ask, can I import? Sure. Well, if you're talking about like the U.S. or Canada... Can I import products into the U.S. or Canada? Sure, but to become an importer is a pretty big deal. You got to learn to work with the port authority. You got all kinds of tax things you got to do. You got to work with uh, uh, customs and border control and all these different things that are part of being an importer. That's why import export businesses are lucrative because there's a lot of work involved and you have to develop expertise and connections and invest a lot of time and money into it. What you're talking about here is becoming an importer. Like you're going to be an import business for one trailer load of stuff. So the, um, if you're just doing that, you just drive across the border, you don't have a deal worked out, you don't have anything set up, you're not an import business, and you come to the border with all that stuff, are they going to allow you to bring it in? Yes. Yeah, that's not a problem. Could the taxes skyrocket over 100% of the brand new purchase value of everything you're bringing in? That's the expectation. You should totally expect that. And if you're doing this to the U.S., if you bring, so for example, a BYD Seagull, brand new car, it's for sale in Costa Rica. I can drive down to Costa Rica, get it for $9,500. I can drive to Mexico, get it for $9,500. Not a problem. That is the value of the car. They sell it worldwide, $9,500. It's a great little car. I'm thinking about getting one. I can bring it into Nicaragua. I can bring it in with no problem because I can bring it in under my, because it's a vehicle, not a trailer, not equipment. Uh, as a resident, I can bring it in that way, right? I get a, like a one-time or a certain price. I don't know exactly the details. I'm even going to find that out for you guys. We're going to do a video about the importing a car. That's one of the reasons why I want to import a car is I want to go through the whole process of getting a new car. Um, so we can talk about, it's not the only reason, but I wanted to be able to talk about exactly how much it cost, exactly what the headache was, exactly what the process was, what the limitations are, that kind of stuff, when I can do it again so that you have that, that idea, right? Because we kind of know details of it, but nobody does this. It's such a generally bad idea to bring in a car from someone else, but bringing one in from Costa Rica is not the same as bringing one in from like the US or Canada. It's right next door. I can still get to a dealer if I need to. It's only a few hours away. It's like buying something from a neighboring city in the US or Canada rather than a different country, more or less. We'll get to that. But when you're talking about just driving over the border, you're the importer. So the amount that you're going to potentially pay is mind boggling. And you have to assume that because if you brought that BYD Seagull into the United States, it should be a $9,500 car, but there is a $9,500 import tax on that vehicle before anything else. That is the tariff alone on the fact that that is a Chinese vehicle. That is because the United States uh, automotive industry isn't competitive, so the U.S. charges huge taxes on incoming vehicles to make sure that the better, higher value, higher quality cars available outside the U.S. don't just flood the market and kill off all the American automakers because if you had an open market, if you had a capitalist free market system, the United States would be unable to make cars anywhere because they're, they just can't make the high quality, low cost cars the way that everyone else can. And so they have to have these 100% markups to guarantee 
guarantee that the cars remain competitive. And even so, people are clamoring to get them because they're still better values in most cases than, say, a Tesla, right? So that's you got to be aware that if you're doing the same thing into Nicaragua, that's if you have an importer in the U.S. If you did your self-import, you would expect pay, to pay much more because there's so many fees at, like the port and such. So if you're coming in to Nicaragua, you're bringing all your equipment, assuming you're buying all that equipment again in taxes because you're self-importing with no deal and you have nobody at the border who has expertise in it. No one is prepared for it. No one wants to give you a deal. They're, a, they're really angry with you, right? Because this ruins their day. So they are not happy people who are like, I'm making some extra money. They're not making extra money. This is going to the government. And this has just made their day really, really hard when no one normally does this. So you're not exactly making people super happy when you do this process. There is a process for this. Everybody does this in every country. I would suggest approaching this in a normal way, and it shouldn't be a big problem. And that, it, like here in Nicaragua, if you want to get something, we all of us import all the time, right? It's not a strange thing to, to do importation, but we never self-import, right? That's when you get into trouble. So I've been at the uh, airport with a guy, had to spend days caught in customs, spent a fortune of his time, huge amount of stress, all because he decided to self-import in a water filter for his house. And it's, of course, a thing that's going to get taxed. You're not allowed to bring in permanent household goods as a tourist. That's an importation. It's not like it's not that you're not allowed to bring it in. It is that you are importing. They are, they are products that are not for travel, and they are permanently going to stay in the country. So you will be penalized. They do not want you to do this. They're not going to stop you, but nobody wants you to do this. So they are going to make you pay through the nose because they want you to tell all of your friends to never do this. So be prepared. You will be used as a lesson for other people if you do this process of self-importation. And that's what happened. He had this one item. It was probably worth less than $300. He probably was taxed $300 more or less with another $300 of his time and effort put into it because he had to stay in hotels, all kinds of things to be able to deal with this. If you get any problems with your importation, you will be in Managua. You'll have to have your vehicle with its trailer. You could be trapped, assume for weeks at a time in a hotel doing nothing but trying to work out customs paperwork in Spanish. And you better hope you've got a great relationship with a lawyer already worked out but you better hope you have drivers and people who know how to get into customs because under normal circumstances, this is one of the hardest things you could do in the country. I've lived here for years. I have lawyers. I have all kinds of information about stuff. I would not consider this in a million years. Just to be clear, would never, ever put myself through that. But are you legally allowed to do it? That's the problem is that legally, sure, you can do it. But does it make sense? Under no conditions, never in the universe would it ever make sense in any country, right? And it could cause problems for you the entire way from Canada to Nicaragua. There's a lot of countries you have to cross through. Every border has the risk of being a problem. You always have the dangers of the countries you're passing through. Not so much that you're going to be, you know, shot for that stuff, but someone might unhook your trailer and steal stuff. Or, you know, you're just more likely to have a problem because you're, a, you're making yourself a huge target. Uh, and you really don't want to do that with dogs, right? You're just that much more vulnerable. And the cost is just going to be crazy. What people do is, one, they wait for their residencia, so you get an importation uh, waiver during your residencia process. So obviously bring the dogs. Obviously get yourself here. But everything else, all your household goods, if you're going to really bring them, and normally we say you don't want to, but if you truly are going to bring them, then you need to be doing so under the residencia because then you get a waiver for, I think it's $20,000 worth of household goods, uh, which is quite a lot. You just put them in a shipping container, you ship through a import process and they just bring them to you. And yes, you got to pay for whatever it takes. So like if I'm bringing in, so that same water filter that that person paid hundreds of dollars and spent days trying to figure out and had to stay in hotels to deal with and all that, had he shipped it, through a Nika box or any one of the myriad services that do that, he should have been able to get that in for about $5. Think about that. He spent hundreds because he wanted to self-import instead of he didn't want to pay the $5 importation fee for a very small item coming through. It's an expensive item, but a small one that they would have just shipped by cargo ship from Miami, no problem at all. I import things from Amazon not all the time, but a couple times a year, right? We do it a couple times a year. What do we do? We ship it to our shipper in Miami. They put it in boxes and they have an importation deal because they're an importer, 
right? They have all the stuff worked out. They do it in huge volume. They're bringing crates through. They pre-inspect. You know, they guarantee there's not going to be any drugs. They they guarantee there's not going to be any drones. They guarantee a bunch of things. When there's electronics, they flag it ahead of time. They have a process. They have a person who stands there all day, knows everyone, and moves everything through really fast, just pays the fees, and it's done, 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 done. And so they're able to take this huge expensive process and make it really cheap because they're doing millions of dollars of goods every day instead of a single one-time item of self-importation. Save yourself incredible heartache. Do that. That is the sensible thing in any country. It has nothing to do with Nicaragua. Nicaragua might be a little bit harder from this perspective just because of the language barriers and how little importation happens. But the fundamentals of when you're moving to a country, don't be a self-importer, especially as a tourist. The amount of problems that that will create in any country anywhere is enormous. So I totally understand why you want to drive down with the dogs. I would consider that myself as well. Uh, what I would suggest is just bite the bullet, do a drive all the way down, drop off the dogs, turn around and drive back as quickly as you can, get everything done with the vehicle, just be done with it, sell the vehicle, sell the trailer, use that income, use all the money you're going to save from not having to spend your life in Managua, spend, take all the money that you would save from not having to drive that larger vehicle and wait down and put what you actually need, pare it down as small as possible, only the things you can't buy in Nicaragua, and put it on a shipping container or something similar and pay someone who's a professional uh, importer to move that into Nicaragua for you at minimal taxes and definitely consider waiting until you have residencia so that you may not have to pay any tax on it at all. You may only have to pay the shipping fee. There's no reason to be paying this super, I mean, I understand you want your stuff right away, but that will not be financially sensible. It will destroy your life. You will be one of our failure stories if you do it that way. So, so definitely when moving to a new country is, I understand that we're very adamant about when you're moving to a new country, like the whole process of becoming an expat, you got to think outside the box. When you actually get to the point where you're doing border crossings and, and importation of your goods, that is not a time to really think outside of the box. That is a time to follow the expected process and I know we push it, like think outside the box all the time, but it shouldn't be outside the box thinking, right? Becoming an expat, moving to a new country should be the absolute go-to mindset for most people. That it's not is mostly because people just do what they're told and don't think about it at all. If they thought about it, it's not really outside the box thinking. It's just outside their ken, perhaps. But uh, when it comes to border crossings, you you don't want to do this. And it's weird. If you think inside the box, most people who've never dealt with going to another country forget it's another country and think of it much like another province or state and think, well, I'll just drive there. That's what I do for moving somewhere else. But you're moving country. You're going overseas. Essentially, you need to have a, a mindset of I'm moving overseas. You don't generally bring your stuff with you. Bringing your stuff with you feels like this just simple process. It is the farthest things from the truth. That is going to be expensive, dangerous, time-consuming, and really expensive. Did I say really expensive? Really hard to do. Just so much effort. You will be sorry, I guarantee. I know you want your stuff. Worry about the dogs uh, and find ways to get your stuff. Work on your residency up really quickly, and you're going to be busy dealing with that. And just think, if you, if you try to bring all this stuff straight down, you're going to lose all your money. You're going to lose all your time. All that time that you could be spending on your residencia, all the time you could be learning to love Nicaragua, all the time you could be playing with your dogs, you're going to lose that because you're going to be stuck in Managua dealing with the paperwork problems that are created from that. You want to avoid that. It's, you're not going to solve a time thing by trying to self-import. It's just not realistic. All right, we got a second question from Galavantan. How is the noise pollution in Leon? Like car horns and blasting music at night, barking dogs, crowing roosters. Okay, the crowing roosters is actually not a problem. It, they exist, but very rare. All of which I heard is normal in Mexico, Ecuador, and other Latin American countries. Absolutely, it's a very Latin American thing. I'm looking for a quiet, non-tourist beach town where I can play in the surf, work out, get a good massage. Oh, there's a comma missing. Work out, get a good massage, relax at local pub. That's going to be a problem. we got to come back to that. Uh, for some great seafood and good company, simple life, a marina nearby would be a plus as I enjoy the boat life. Okay, so this is actually a little bit tough in Nicaragua. So first of all, 
quiet non-tourist beach town. So the first thing you have to understand is that the fewer tourists you have, the noisier a place is going to get because tourists are typically pretty quiet, at least in comparison to Nicaraguans. Nicaraguans are a loud bunch. So basically anywhere you have population, you're looking at there being a bunch of loud. So if the quiet beaches, for example, in this region, Salinas Grandes and, and Playa Tesoro, they are very quiet under normal circumstances because there's very few Nicaraguans. There's loads of tourists, loads <laughs> in comparison to the locals. There's not loads of anybody in those beaches. They're, they're very empty. And that's what makes them attractive from a quiet perspective is that very low number of people and the people that are there are spread out. And the, and the type of people tend to be very quiet. They don't tend to be having these parties. So that is a little bit of a challenge if you get to a non-touristy beach. Um, so Las Penitas is kind of in the middle, the one that I show a lot. San Juan del Sur, totally touristy. Uh, if you get to the other beaches, Boqueta and, and uh, um, uh, Pochamil and, and other places that are not touristy, at least not foreign touristy, then uh, you're, you're getting really loud because the Nicaraguans are there with music and, and crows and there's pigs running in the street. And like, it's just how people live. People want noise. They will fill any silence that they can. So if you're around people, assume you're going to fill silence. Now, if you go, especially far up North, you can get to empty beaches that are pretty quiet. There are some beaches in Rivas, but they're all full of expats, right? I don't know of any exception down in Rivas, that you could get some that are quiet, but you're going to get expensive, non-local. You're not going to be integrating. Up north, especially in Chinandega, you can get to some beaches that start getting quiet but are not full of tourists. You could maybe get lucky on the loop where you're not isolated like Salinas Grandes and Tesoro, but you are with locals and it's in a more, more quiet zone. That is the beaches um, from El Transito and up to Puerto Sandino on that loop road. There's several in there. It would only, you know, I've done some videos where we drove that during the day and showed them. It's not hard to go see those. So that and the northern Chinandega beaches, I think, are your best bet to be able to get to quiet and still have some amount of people around. That's that's about the best you can do. How is the noise pollution in, Le in Leon? It's terrible. That's why we moved out of Leon. Right. So I'm, I'm in this in the barrio here. Here it's pretty good. But you can I, I isolate it I, as I'm speaking. I hear nonstop cars behind me, but it's not too much like horns and stuff. Definitely barking dogs. Uh, music at night. Not very often because we're a little bit isolated. Um, but this is in the barrio in the city. All these things. Uh, car horns are not actually that bad. This is not like New York where people just hit the horn all the time. But you will hear car horns in the city blasting music at night non-stop your walls will shake from it the worst thing offenders are the churches this is the thing you don't realize churches have bells that have never stopped they set up fireworks like you wouldn't believe and they blast loudspeakers into the neighborhoods so stay away if you want to be quiet avoid churches at all costs they are the absolute bastions of noise pollution in the city they are the worst neighbors to have no consideration for other people whatsoever always stay away from churches in in latin america uh, so, so surf, everything north of San Juan del Sur basically is going to have surf. Some are really good. Some are just moderate, but basically you have surf everywhere. That's not bad. But now where you get into get a good massage, local pub, uh, marina, now you're getting into problems. So basically there's no marinas in Nicaragua. That's not hundred percent true. Just basically there's one marina that I know of, uh, up in the Chinandega zone. Very, very very isolated area uh, and, and very expensive because it's just a resort town with the marina. And I know of one at San Juan del Sur. That's kind of it. People don't have boats here. What they do have is fishing boats and they push them from estuaries and stuff. There's no marinas. So looking for a marina is going to be nearly impossible. Looking for a pub. Now, I understand. I know what pub means in the British context and the, the local public house where people gather and hang out. That as a concept exists everywhere. You could be out in the country. Some of you guys see me walk way out in the country. If I do that, you will see pubs in the Nicaraguan style fairly often. And you'll get quite a lot, even in remote, poor areas where you're like, no one could possibly afford to go out. Those bars will be packed quite often on a night. People are just having a beer or two. They're getting really cheap local food, but you're not going to get tourists at them. It's going to be all locals or people like me. And even I'm not there that often, but I will go to them. But very, very few uh, foreigners will do so. So if you're looking to hang out with Nicaraguans in the local community place, no problem. But it's nothing like a pub in England, right? So if that's what you're picturing, which I definitely love, I love pub culture in England, think about a pub, but with a live rock band on a night where everyone's wasted.
Pub culture is definitely one of those areas where it's just difficult to replicate anywhere in Nicaragua. I'm used to what it's like in England. I'm familiar with it, and it's stuff that I love. I really wish we had that here. I wish that was something that we could replicate within the part of a coconut, replicate within uh, Nicaraguan culture, but it really just isn't. And Nicaraguans just do not like going out that way. It's one of the most amazing things is the level. Coming from North America, where I'm used to the idea that you would have loud music during a normal dinner, during hanging out with friends, is so abnormal. And hear the entire absence of silence. Anytime, if a family is sitting out on the street, they're going to have a speaker out with music going. Someone's in the pool, you're going to have a speaker by the pool. You're having dinner, there's going to be a speaker. You're, you're at a restaurant, there's going to be a speaker. Unless there's a live band playing, and even then, and if you take that away, if you don't have loud enough music, people will pull out their phones and just crank up the volume and put them on their tables. It's everywhere. And then you just have this cacophony of people making noise everywhere because there's something about it's a cultural thing. You have to fill the silence at all times. At low, It's such a hard thing for me. So that is something that getting away from that is so hard because basically any place that you would go where Nicaraguans would go, so it's cultural to fill the, the the void, and so you start creating this extra noise. There are there are every so often an exception. I'm not saying it's 100, percent but it's really close. Like it's it's impossible to describe how ubiquitous this is as a problem. It's not a problem, but as a, if it's the thing that you want is quiet, like I do, it's a problem. And because I'm hard of hearing, it, it is it is possibly for me. And I don't think to mention this often enough. It is easily. The hardest thing for me living in Nicaragua is the inability to be in a social situation where I can hear people. Because any situation where I can start to hear people, someone will attempt to solve that problem by creating a bunch of loud noise. I love the live music thing. I like hearing music, but people want to talk over it. That combination of people wanting to have music and wanting to talk is the thing that, that I can't do. I just can't hear people's voices when they do that. So um, I think you have some challenges here. Uh, the things you want are all absolutely great things to want, but it's a tough combination in Nicaraguan culture. But I encourage you to come down, check it out, investigate some beaches. Definitely check out some northern Chinandega beaches, also known as El Viejo beaches. That is the far northwest. Uh, you're going to get very remote out there, but you may get some more quiet villages where you can get a little bit more remote. There is a marina out there, but um, very, very little limited marina access. That is about your only option in that area. You could end up in some place, you know, you're getting really remote, but Potosi, way out in the northeast of the peninsula, you're still in the, the Gulf of Fonseca. Um, there, in theory, you might be able to put in some boats, but then you're getting off the ocean, you're on the, the it, it's a little bit weird. I've not been up there. I, I do want to go up. Like, that would be a cool trip to do. It's not that far away. It's the neighboring departmento. And I tried it nine years ago, and the road was impassable. But I hear that they've improved that a lot since then, uh, especially now that the port is open. That is a port of entry. So you can go to uh, El Salvador from there and presumably Honduras. But I don't know any way to do the Honduras trip. El Salvador has a ferry. It would be really nice if there was a ferry to both. Maybe someday. Uh, it would also be nice if the ferry was more than a lancha. Maybe someday. Okay, so so definitely I encourage you to check out those. I think checking out Las Penitas, which will be very different than what you're picturing, but may come close enough to kind of meet your needs. No marina anywhere in the area, but maybe you can come up with some creative strategy that, that meets your needs. Does not have pub type culture, but it does have a bit more restaurants. And there are parts of the beach where you can get and still be around people, but be a little bit farther away from the, the parts of town that are loud. So you may be able to find a mix of things in Las Penitas or Ponaloya that could meet your needs. Um, I think that uh, um, Tesoro and uh, Salinas Grandes are too remote for the things that you want. And I think the Leon Beach Loop, that's the one with El Transito and Puerto Sandino and all the little beaches in between, has some potential. That doesn't mean that other places in the country uh, will, will definitely not be of interest, but I think those three areas... Um, so, so skipping Corinto, which is the official Chinandega beaches, um, and, and skipping Las Brasiles, the Leon beach that is just too remote and skipping Salinas Grandes, the middle Leon beaches that are too remote. Uh, I think those three areas, the El Viejo beaches in the Northwest, possibly Potosí, but that seems like a wild exotic stretch. Um, the, uh, Las Penitas Ponaloya, uh, pair, and then the Leon beach loop. 
Those are your most likely bets. Now, south of there, uh, uh, the Managua Zone does have some interesting beaches. I don't feel like they're going to meet your needs, but I could be wrong. Um, and the Carrasso Zone south of that, again, doesn't feel like it's going to meet your needs as well as the northern ones. And I think even the northern ones, I love it up here, but they don't sound like they're going to be great fits for you. I'm not sure where is, and this may be a case. I, I, I'm hesitant to tell you Nicaragua is not the right place for you. Please come check it out and see for yourself if the things you discover are worth adjusting what you're looking for. But it is my guess that the slightly different waterfront and the slightly different culture that you're going to encounter in either El Salvador or Guatemala may be a slightly better mix for you. You may be able to get the marinas that you want. You may, you're almost certainly going to get a slightly less wild and loud culture. Still, still <laughs> Central America. It doesn't get that much different, but it may get a little bit better for what you're looking for. So you may want to check those out as well. They do offer some really great living options um, in addition to Nicaragua. And the, the price starts changing, but you didn't mention that as a real important thing, but you may be just saying, you know, Nicaragua is a, a high consideration because of the cost. So El Salvador and Guatemala aren't that far off in cost from Nicaragua. We're talking very small differences. They're more, but they're not a lot more under normal circumstances. They're exceptions, of course, but in general, we're all pretty close in this region. Panama may offer some things that you're looking for quite a bit higher prices, but they're much more of a quiet culture, a lot more likely to have pubs. I do know pubs exist in Costa Rica as well, but they're in the city, not on the beach. There may be some on the beach. I know of them in the city, uh, but Costa Rica is going to be a wildly different thing than the rest. And Panama will be pretty different. The other three, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, very similar. You really can, can explore all of them together and, and see what makes sense for you. Um, Panama would be a stretch, but still within the general region, may fit better, except the pricing and culture are very different. So um, it may be that it doesn't fit the things you had, you didn't mention because they were being assumed. So just things to think about or ask more questions, get down there, ask more, send in a video question, of course. Uh, but thanks, guys, for your questions. Um, I hope that I answered them. I'm sorry that it's in both of these cases, the answer is not great. Like, you can just do that thing. That's awesome, easy. No, in both cases, it's, it's going to be a little bit hard to find what you want. And bringing down all that importation stuff is going to be a nightmare. But We'd be doing you a disservice to try to make it sound like that was going to be easy. Legal? Yes. Easy? Whew. No. Cheap? <laughs> no. There's got to be a better way. Strategize a different way, but make sure you get the dogs down safely. That's the most important thing. Thanks, everybody. Like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. It's down there at the bottom or on the top. I don't know. We'll put it somewhere. And uh, as always, I'll see all of you tomorrow.